three months to the process. Thereafter, if a party doesn't um, adhere to the yes. determination order, then it's a case of going to the courts. In terms of going to the courts, we currently approach the circuit court, and there's different circuit courts with different times around the country, so we don't have any control over those particular time periods, and they vary depending on adjournments and so on, so we wouldn't have a specific timeline for you on that. The only piece we have control over is the piece all the way up to the tribunal and getting the determination order from that. You mentioned substandard accommodation and the tenant's fear of making complaints. At present, I suppose we don't specifically deal with the standard of accommodation. It's the remit of the local authorities to go out, although we will hear a dispute if a tenant makes a complaint. But we do fund the inspection services provided by local authorities to the tune of circa two million per annum. Um, my understanding is that the department are currently looking at, I suppose, a, a more efficient method for this uh, inspection of properties. And I think more inspections would me mean less less complaints from tenants and that fear would then come back. So I think things looking, being looked at there are maybe more shared services opportunities to try and increase the amount of inspections that can happen. Um, we have funded up to 30 million so far in inspections by local authorities. Um, you mentioned deposits. Um, as you're aware, the Residential Tenancies Act, or the amended Residential Tenancies Act, provides for a deposit protection scheme. That's due to become operational in 2017. Um, there is a significant amount of work that needs to be done by us to prepare for that, um, as the scheme involves a significant amount of, of money in terms of the potential of 200 to 300 million that we could end up holding. Therefore, we need quite extensive IT services, but we also need to be able to be in a position where we can hand back this money quickly to tenants without causing the situation to worsen from them in terms of moving on. So the timelines for that is 2017. We're beginning the procurement process in terms of the services that we need to provide for that at the moment. Um, but I suppose just to say, as I mentioned in my opening statement at the moment, we have 20% of cases which are related to deposits, which is a drop from previously. Um, and that is we only have 1% to 2% of disputes in our overall tenancies anyway. So it, it, it is quite a limited number of cases that are coming through to us at present. In terms of Deputy Jerkin, um, just, I suppose you mentioned about the reliance on the rental sector. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to um, insinuate that we should rely on the rental sector. What I was saying was that I, I believe it's inevitable that we will have a, 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 a bigger rental sector than we traditionally have had. When you look at the migration in terms of incoming migration into the country, um, and as I said, there's 75% of non-Irish nationals are currently in the private rental sector. Um, and we also have an economy uh, whereby we have more influx of workers coming into the country who are also relying on the rental sector and are choosing to rely on the rental sector. And the third thing I would just say in terms of that is tenants from what we are seeing, are also staying longer in the sector. So the reliance on the sector is for a longer period of time than we would have traditionally seen. And even if they are on a pathway to home ownership, they're taking longer. Because they can't than get out of the rental sector. Because yeah. they can't save. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not commenting on whether that's right no, or that's wrong. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm just commenting on the, on the facts of the situation. Um, the disputes, I hope I've, I've, I've answered your question on that, and what we'll do is we can send you further information on that. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Butler. Thanks for that, and thanks for the presentation. Um, two questions. Uh, you were saying there that it's your remit to regulate and support the rental housing market, but how do you cope with the landlords who don't register or who don't want to get involved? Because I had an experience of it this week. I had a, um, a single parent in a home and the landlord was trying to put up the rent for the second time in six months. So when I got involved and pointed out that, you know, 90 days notice and he had already put it up, um, he, he, was at, he was actually just outside the timeline, so he knew that. But as soon as somebody kind of, don't get me wrong, but with a little bit of authority got involved, he was intimidating the, the tenant. 
and uh, you know she was finding it very hard to cope and th that's the question really how, how, how do you get involved in cases like that if, if, if the landlord isn't registered with you and the second um, you're saying you have 324,000 tenancies in relation to student accommodation which I'm sure must be a big part of your remit especially you know when, when, when the colleges start up again um, it, this is, this is a, a personal case. Um, my own son was in college in Cork and it, there was four boys in, in, in a house, 350 per month each. So it was 1,400 rent. And when I complained about the condition of the house and the cleanliness of it, I was just told to uh, take a hike, take my son with me and he'd have somebody else there within an hour. That they had a waiting list of 20 to 30 people. So I'm just wondering in situations like that, what role do you play? Thank you. Deputy, uh, I'll take a few. Uh, Deputy Coppinger. Um, yeah, just wanted to ask you about the massive increase in the private rented sector that you referred to and that's been referred to. Um, according to your figures and the Department of the Environment has said the same, there were 282,980 in rented properties at the end of 2013 and without boring everybody with all the figures but basically by the end by 2015 that had increased dramatically and there's now 324,000 tenancies registered and 705,000 tenants we have to register just how big a sector this is now in Ireland um, so much for our love of, of home ownership but how do you account for that increase? Um, is it because landlords are registering and they didn't bother before? Or is it because, like far from this like flexible workforce who love renting that you hinted at there, that there is no social housing and that public house building has virtually ground to a halt? Um, so I, I do agree with things that have been said about I do not welcome this because would you maybe talk about what rights tenants in this country have compared to tenants in other countries. Could you give maybe some examples of um, security of tenure in Ireland as compared to other countries in Europe? Because that's what this committee needs to hear about. Um, just the other thing you refer to, um, we're constantly hearing that landlords will fly out of the rented sector if Anton's done to inhibit them, you know, in terms of rent controls or anything like that. It's a, it's a daily thing on the radio now. But um, despite uh, the rent mild rent certainty measures that were brought in, like in terms of the two-year lease, it wasn't really rent certainty, there's been a big increase in landlords in the sector. So would you agree that this is all spoofing, that actually, you know, there's lots of money to be made in the private rented sector? Um, so... Another fact is about the change in the landlords. You were saying that on page four that over 80% of our landlords own only one or two properties. Um, the PRTB's annual report said 84%. So does that mean that it's fallen by 4% or is it that the profile of landlords is changing because of the entry into the market of REITs, for example? And I wanted to ask what you thought about those landlords and how they treat their tenants. Um, for example, one of the biggest REITs, uh, the Iris REIT, which increased the number of homes it owns from 1,500 apartments in Dublin to over 2,000 now. So it's the biggest landlord in the country, technically. In the last year, it's increased its rents by 9.1%, from 1,250 a month to 1,370 a month. On average, that's obviously average. It's a lot higher in some cases. So tenants of that REIT are now shelving out of their own pockets €172 Euros a month more than they did uh, a few years ago. That's €2,000 out of their pockets a year. Um, now the reason I raise it is that there's political parties in the Dáil that have welcomed these REITs into the country. And if you have evidence, and the evidence seems very strong to me, that it's influencing rents going up in, in the country, by putting rents up, other smaller landlords are going to follow suit. Um, now we've already had vulture lover terms talked about earlier. We won't go there again. Yeah. Thank you, Deputy. Um, thank you. You're welcome. But um, I think, for example, the Green Party, the Labour Party even, welcomed REITs into the private rented market in, uh, recently. 
and the Department of Finance said that it hoped they welcomed them in. They gave them tax breaks, so obviously they must have welcomed them. Why would you give a tax break if you didn't want more of them? Um, and I just wanted to ask you about uh, the rent arrears and overholding. You say uh, your disputes have changed. It's no longer the deposit used to be the big thing. Now it's rent arrears and overholding um, make up a huge number of your cases. Um, I, this is probably a very obvious question, but it needs to be asked. Why is that? Why has that now changed? Um, why are people overholding? And just so people understand what overholding means, that you stay in a house or an apartment or whatever beyond the time that you've been told. Either is it because you're, in your cases that you mentioned the lease has ended or people have actually gone beyond notices to quit? Would you agree that the reason that people are overholding isn't because they've suddenly become greedy, but that the alternative is homelessness? That's why they're overholding. And if tenants don't overhold, stay in the property, they'll be on the street, literally, in emergency accommodation. So um, Thank you, Deputy. It's, it's very important that because the people that are out there listening to this have to understand that if they don't overhold, actually, well, then they will actually be seeking emergency accommodation with all of the other people. Thank you. Deputy yeah. Cal. Chairman, just a brief question in relation to staffing levels within, at your own, uh, within your own service. Um, you know, I think they've been reduced over the last five years, despite the fact that your workload, I'm sure, has increased very much over the last five years, particularly over the last couple of years. And could you make a comment uh, on, in that area? Because if it were a recommendation of this committee that improvements be made in relation to staffing and resources to deal with the backlog that exists and the length of time it's taking to adjudicate and make recommendations on cases. Thank you, Deputy. Ms. Gara. <coughs> Um, Deputy Butler, um, you asked about landlords not registering. How, we do, how do we deal with that? I think the, the first thing to say, regardless of whether a landlord is registered, a tenant is always entitled to make a complaint to the RTB. So it doesn't matter whether the, from, a, from a tenant perspective whether a landlord is registered or not. That doesn't apply to landlords, by the way. If landlords want to make a dispute to us, they must be registered. In terms of our overall... Um, compliance rates. It's quite difficult for us to determine where we, are, where we are with them because the absolute measure, I suppose, that we have of the number of properties and the number of tenancies is the only place that you can find that really is the census. So the 2011 census, we would, looking at those figures, suggest that we had a compliance rate of about 85%. Um, since that, though, in 2013, we brought in some measures with the Department of Social Protection um, and a new system for checking compliance and data matching with them, and we believe our compliance rates would be significantly higher since then, and that might address some of Deputy Coppinger's uh, in terms of maybe some of the increases that we would have seen in our uh, number of landlords would have been specifically to the 2013 year because of an increase in our overall compliance at that time. Um, so I, I hope that deals with, with that issue. In terms of student accommodation, yeah, we estimate that about 30, about 11 per cent of overall tenancies are, are students um, within Ireland at the, at the moment, and that's based on the sample that we did in the DKM survey in 2014, so I, I presume it hasn't changed that much. If anything, it will have dropped somewhat because of the supply issues. Um, Again, in terms of trying to deal with that, there was no tenancy created in that situation, so we can only deal with a dispute where there is a tenancy. If there isn't a tenancy and there's an issue with standards, you can, can still make a referral to the local authority in respect of the standard of accommodation, but we can't deal with an issue until the tenancy exists. Okay. In terms of Deputy Coppinger, the, 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 a few questions there. Um, I think the, the, the first was about whether the number of landlords registering, if, if what, what is it and why are the number of tenancies increasing? Um, as I said, we do think we had a higher number increase in terms of 2013 just due to a compliance issues. Um, but what I think is happening is incrementally, yes, the amount of people in the rental sector is increasing. We do believe the rental sector is increasing. So what we're saying is the amount of people within the rental sector, um, the number of new tenancy creating is st stabilising because people are staying longer in their tenancies. And then there's new additions happening every year. So yes, incrementally, we do believe it's increasing. 
you asked whether social housing was the main driver for that. Um, now, it's difficult for us to know. When we register a tenancy, we don't register and say it's a rent supplement recipient or it's a HAP recipient. They're just a, a tenant to us. But I suppose we do know that 100,000, um, or we, we estimate that about 100,000 of people in the rental sector are in some form of relief from the state, whether it's rent supplement or the housing assistance payment. That would have been in 2004 or 2005 at about 60,000. So with that, you would have a net increase over that years of 40,000 in terms of overall numbers. Um, you asked me to refer to other countries and examples elsewhere of, I suppose, regulation within the rental sector. And there are a lot of examples in Germany, in the Netherlands and so on. And you will see rent regulation um, that is related maybe to CPI index and there are uh, other examples whereby the, uh, the state might uh, agree on the rent setting and how rent setting is done for a particular district um, and then they would look um, at you can only increase rent by a specific proportion and you might average rents over a four year period for instance so you might say you can only set rents within the average rents for this particular area but over a four year period so that it dampens that over it dampens the uh, overall effect of the increase over that period of time um, Scotland have just introduced a new bill actually which has looked at rent pressure zones and controlling rents in just particular rent pressure zones rather than affecting the whole of the rental sector. So if there's a particular area that has a particular issue that it gives the local authority the power to just look at a rent pressure zone area. So that's another example um, of regulation. Overall what I would say is particularly when we look to our European countries um, when we look at the rental sector there, the, the, the distinction between the social and the private rental is so, there isn't a, such a huge distinction there. And therefore, when you're bringing in changes in regulation and so on, the impacts of it are slightly different. And that's why I refer in my statement to understanding about where we want to get to and the transition that we need to get there in terms of what impacts that we might have. And you asked also then about, I suppose, the the question marks about what will happen if we suddenly introduce um, regulation in terms of exits from the market. You're right in the sense we have no evidence at the moment in terms of the recent rent certainty measures to see any mass exodus from the market. In fact, in the last year, um, our landlord numbers have increased, not decreased. Excuse me. Yeah. Also, in terms of number of units of property have they gone up as well well we register tenancies so there, yes the over the absolute number of tenancies has increased to 324 we were at 319 at the end of 2015 so that's only in december so in that period of time yes tenancies continue to increase um, and as does the landlord numbers um, now with with the way the legislation legislation is set up there's not necessarily always an incentive for a tenant or a landlord to tell us when a tenancy ends so our figures are not absolutes they're guides in terms of the trends um, however i think they probably are relatively accurate and um, i think in terms of the rent certainty measures there are not all landlords are always increasing rents and maybe maybe that's reflected in the fact that the, we haven't seen the exits in the market um, but and the changes that have been brought in have been limited and i suppose the question about exits from the market depends on how how broad ranging the changes affecting the market are that you're intending to bring in would would be um, how quickly they're going to come in. Are they going to come in overnight or are they going to come in over a periodic uh, length of time? Um, one survey, I'm not sure if the committee are aware of it, 123.ie did a survey that was published there last week um, and it included landlords. It was a relatively big sample and would have echoed a lot of what our original DKM survey did. And that said that a number of landlords, again, it said at least 29% of landlords were looking to exit the market, but they were waiting for their properties to go back to a certain value before they were going to go. And the question mark is not so much on the rent regulation side, but particularly on the sales side in terms of um, 
if there are question marks starting to rise on uh, whether you can sell with or without uh, vacant possession, whether that would suddenly lead to those people making decisions to, to go out of the market now. And likewise, in terms of the 29,000 that are in mortgage arrears issues, will the banks suddenly start pushing on on those? And the question, we, do, we don't know the answer to those things. A lot of these are unknowns, but all we can look at it is the data. And again, it's I'm not here to, to tell the committee what to do. It's more when you do it, are you aware of where the impacts might might be and maybe it's about the direction of travel and having certainty on that direction of travel and whether any uncertainties in the meantime are going to create more pressure points in terms of supply and um, so that that would be the, the main issues on that and i suppose in relation to the security of tenure issue and um experience elsewhere, security tenure is generally much stronger in our European counterparts um, and sale with tenants in situ is much more common. However, we are only at a new start of a new culture of renting in this country and as well as changing law maybe we need to consider culture and change of culture. So we, if we look at commercial renting rather than residential renting, it's quite common for people to sell with tenants in situ and in fact it increases the value of the property at the point of sale. We have spoken and our landlords, we work a lot with our stakeholders but landlords and tenants alike, but the landlord groups that we've spoken to have indicated to us that sale at the moment without vacant possession would lead to a decrease of somewhere in between of about 25% in the property value at the moment. Um, in other countries, how they protect for that in regulation is they have said, OK, you, will, you must sell with tenants in situ. You can't evict tenants just because of sale. But if the property price is to change by more than 20%, then that's an exception, and then you can come away from that. So there are examples trying to deal with those very specific issues. Um, just the changing profile, then, of the landlord sector. We don't have specific numbers on... Uh, the actual changes, so I refer to over 80%. Um, our feel for it at the moment, and as I said, we don't have the actual specifics, is that the, the REITs and maybe the institutional landlords probably make up about 1% to 2% of our overall landlords, but that's not necessarily 1% to 2% of the properties. We don't have the definitives on it just yet, um, but, but that's where we feel um, the, the, the figures are. Um, you asked, I suppose, for my opinion on REITs and whether I thought they contributed to the overall rental sector or what impact I thought they were having on the, on the rental sector. Um, institutional investment is something that has been called for for the rental sector for as long as I've been in the housing um, business, which is over 16 years. Um, and they have something to bring in terms of professionality, in terms of quality of accommodation and so on. For me, what's important is ensuring that we have competition in the market going forward um, and that the rate at which we see increases of significant landlords is what we need to be trying to monitor to ensure that we suddenly don't have an overall investor of one size whereby the competition in the market is starting to evaporate. And I referred into my statement in terms of how that, I suppose, is uh, balanced elsewhere is that the not-for-profit sector are also providing uh, rental housing to much broader elements of society. Um, and that in itself then helps to dampen the overall market. In terms of rent arrears and overholding, um, and you asked to, me to, I think, to explain why rent arrears are going up. As I said in my statement, our indications are rent arrears are going up simply because people cannot afford some of the rents that are there. Um, the overholding situation does tend to differ somewhat. It depends. There's, there, there is genuine cases in terms of overholding, and some of those will come through our mediation service. And our mediation service has been quite successful in terms of getting voluntary agreements between landlord and tenants, of giving people extensions of time to find properties, and said, listen, I think I might be able to be able to get a property in another three months' time rather than in a month's time, or whatever it happens to be. Um, and there are very genuine cases where people simply cannot find alternative accommodation. We do have a, a small, but, but it is still there, a small cohort of people where the overholding is as a result of non-compliance, um, whereby people have arrears or have damages that are uh, 
show maybe significant levels that are beyond uh, affordability. They are simply cases where people have never paid rent. And the overholding in those situations is a is, is slightly different um, situation. Um, but there are a mixture of cases, as I said, um, and uh, th th there's only a small proportion where we would see overholding being because people have not um, paid any rent whatsoever. Uh, Deputy Cowan, you referred to our staffing levels. Yes, we had staffing levels of 70 uh, people at one point. Uh, that was reduced down to 33. We're now back up to 40, and we have sanctioned for a further 10. The sanction for a further 10 is, I suppose, as a result of the Deposit Protection Scheme and also the recent legislative changes. Um, depending on how far or further the rental sector expands, yes, that will need to be increased somewhat. Depending on what comes out in terms of the overall reform of the sector, we may need to have further resources as well. At the moment, we also rely heavily on an outsourced centre to provide our services. So while we have 40 staff, there are further 30-odd staff working in an outsourced centre providing our uh, frontline customer service provision. Um, and then we have legal providers who are also providing us with legal advice in relation to our judicially um, type services. Um, so that's an overall reflection of our services at the moment. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Wallace. Thank you. Um, just back to the point about your 80% of landlords own, own only one or two properties. Um, I don't expect you to have the figure now, but could you get us the figure for how many properties are owned by the, by the top 20 uh, individual owners, be they uh, investment funds or single individuals? The top 20, how, how much properties they are controlling in the rental sector in Ireland? Um, you, you, I mean, there's, um, you were talking as well about the need not, not to kind of scare people out of the market. Already, many of the landlords that own one or two are going to get out. Well, I mean, so be it. But it's, uh, do you not think that it's a, that's not necessarily an argument uh, for a lack of control and regulation? And I, I'm wondering, have, have you looked at, at what's going on in Switzerland, which I find very interesting? With, with the vulture funds now, after purchasing so much of good development land, in Ireland, especially in Dublin, with a view not to building and flogging them, but to building and rental. I mean, the Kennedy Wilsons and the Hines are here for the, the long haul. They see a very lucrative rental market, and they are going to exploit it to great benefit. Now, you talk about competition. Uh, well, I would argue that competition has almost dis is, is disappearing because of the influx of vulture funds, because they have for all practical purposes. Uh, do you not see an impact of, of a sort of a type of cartel on behalf, on the part of the vulture funds? Uh, I mean, I've made the example in here a few times where a two-bed apartment in Dominic Street has gone from 900 a month to 1,500 a month, and it is directly linked to the fact that so f uh, a few small players have gained a serious foothold in the market here. And uh, I wonder if, if you have looked at Switzerland, where, for example, if if you were going. To, if you were a developer of, or an investment fund buying land in Switzerland, when you were finished it, the rent you could charge them would be determined by how much you, it cost you to put them there. And you have to open your books and prove exactly every penny you spent. So you know, the, the state knows exactly what it cost you to put them there. You are allowed then, your rent then is determined by that. And there's a, they have another very good, what I would see as a very positive initiative as well is where if a landlord makes improvements to his property he's allowed to charge more rent if he has to prove how much he spent on the improvements it makes the property better and it encourages landlords uh, to keep a better quality unit and i'm just wondering is it, have have you is, would you have any thoughts on that and uh, i think uh, you, you're saying that the, the new big landlord is more professional, but uh, also he's less affordable. And uh, if we're going to, I mean, I agree with you, I think the rental sector is going to grow. Uh, even if we do build a lot more social housing like we should, we are probably going to look, uh, there's less and less people going to be able to afford to buy their home in Ireland. But uh, if we're going to watch the rental sector grow, if we leave 
the best part of control and regulation to the markets, well, it's going to mean very little protection for the people that have no choice only go into the rental market. Uh, just your thoughts on that as well, please. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Byrne. Catherine Byrne. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you all. Um, uh, Roger. Yeah. The document. I suppose there's just two, th two questions. First of all, I just want to uh, concur with, um, with Deputy O'Sullivan's remarks around accommodation and the standard of accommodation. Uh, and some of it I've seen myself as appalling. And I'm delighted to hear that they are inspected. But when properties are inspected and the, the landlord is asked to do A, B and C, whatever it is, is there another inspection to make sure that it is done? Because I, I just would be interested to know that. Regarding the homeless and, and regarding rent certainty, and in the last couple of weeks, I've noticed myself with my own, uh, my own um, people coming into me that some of them are being told that the property is going to go up for sale. And when a few months later you look at, back at that same property, it hasn't gone up for sale, but the people have had to leave because the landlord now is getting a higher income off a private. Um, so when certainly that's, that's, that's what's happening when I can see anyway. The other thing about tenancy rights, and um, I find it often now people coming in to me just to know what their rights are. And it's, it's, it's increasing all the time, uh, the demand on that, even into the office. So what, 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 what do you think could be done to make tenancy rights more out there for people? How, how do you think we as a committee could enforce something like that into the future if we can? And what do you do yourself for that? And just on the last thing, and I agree with this, it, it, looking at older people in the rental sector and the disposable, the reduce of their income as they get older. And I, I would be one that would advocate that the council and voluntary housing should look at building more senior citizens. Because the older people I deal with who aren't in local authority senior citizen accommodation, I find the rents that are paying are absolutely huge towards if they were a local tenant in the council. And do you have any just remarks around that? Thanks. Deputy O'Dowd. Uh, just sorry for being late. Just one question. I think your, your duties have been expanded recently in terms of extended to local authority tenancies. And it's in relation to that I have a question. Um, and it's not a criticism uh, of anybody, but you have some uh, tenancies uh, in local authority estates which have been, for years, have been causing very significant antisocial problems. It may be drugs, it may be alcohol abuse, it may be dysfunctional people, uh, and they're intractable and they've never been properly dealt with. Uh, and also, I, I get very little complaints. Um, from people who are residing in private accommodation, but I'm getting some for local authorities' own houses outside of the local authority estate, and there's some issues in some places in relation to those. So how do you propose to tackle that? I think you mentioned extra staff, I think, was that part of your uh, 10 extra people there. And how do you see your role? Because I think it's absolutely critical um, to make sure that local authorities actually do their job, you know, if that's a fair, fair comment. Thank you. Just one additional question, and, and uh, I don't know if you have the answer, but obviously when a landlord is filling up and filing, um, filling the application, uh, there are a number of questions asked, as in the size of the house, the number, who's living in it, and so forth. And I'm wondering if from the information that's supplied to you, you can identify what, where bed sits rather than apartments and so forth. And if you can, can you indicate to us, since the re new regulations were introduced, has there been a reduction in the number of available bedsits units that are in uh, use? So I start with De Deputy Wallace's uh, comments. Um, I don't have off the top of my head the, the, the top 20, uh, but we will look through our data and send it to you. It is something I, 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 I sought myself just yesterday, but I, I, I don't have it, so I will have a look and see. It doesn't readily come available from our data, but I'm sure we can uh, dig down into it. I wasn't aware of the specific model um, in Switzerland, and it, it sounds very interesting. Um, I suppose that the only thing that... I would question in terms of where we're at at the moment is, is the cost of provision in, in the first instance and whether that will actually lead to um, a more affordable rent or not for people within that particular model and I don't know enough about it but I'm, I'm happy to look, to look at it um, but that, that, that would be my initial thing and I know um, 
cost rental has also come up here on a number of occasions, which is basically providing for the level of cost. And um, having looked at that previously myself, in certain areas in Ireland, that would actually lead to increase in cost unless there's significant subsidy put in from, from the state. And so we need to think about how those things would happen. So the, the cost uh, benefit doesn't come until 30 years later on the basis of a maturation whereby the, the development cost and the mortgage costs come down over that period of time. Um, and it's only we need to see how much in terms of economies of scale that would actually benefit Ireland. So while it worked well in European countries, at what level of scale would we need to introduce it here for it to have an overall dampening effect on the rental sector? And that's something that nobody has digged down to yet in terms of coming up with an actual quantitative answer that says, well, what is the answer to that? Um, in terms of rent regulation and overall rental regulation of the, of the sector, I suppose our, our view in terms of whether it, it has a dampening effect on supply or not, it, I suppose I keep coming back to it's more about whether there's a strategy for where we're going with, with the sector and that there's a, a clear vision of where we're going and that if we think it's going to have impacts on su supply, can we look at where those impacts will be? So it's not to say we don't go there, it's just to, to be aware of them so that if we know there's going to be some landlords that fall off, do we know what's going to happen to those tenants in between? And that's really more the point that, 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 we're, that, that I was making, not, not saying don't, don't go ahead and do regulation, but if we are, what are we going to do at, the, at those weak points where we think that there might be an issue so that we don't in that instance cause a greater problem? Um, and that might be just thinking about things a little bit differently and knowing. And I suppose one of the things that maybe is, it might be interesting to the committee is the tax measures that were brought in um, just before Christmas as part of the overall measures to address the rental sector. Um, if landlords are to avail of RAS, HAP and rent supplement, they could avail of 100% tax relief and they were to register with us and then revenue to process it. And so on the basis if a uh, tenant was to stay with them for three years. Existing landlords of those tenants had to register with us by the 31st of March this year. Um, we would reckon that there's a hundred thousand, as I said, tenants that would be more, or tenancies that would be more or less eligible for that. If you take people with mortgages, it might be sixty thousand to seventy thousand when you take that into account. We've had seven hundred and fifty landlords apply for that. So, as a measure, I'm not sure that it has gone any way to addressing the issue, and that's because we haven't thought about how it'll impact the landlord. Um, um, the fact that it's retrospective, it's only after three years that the landlord would actually get the benefit of the uh, tax relief. Is the interest itself in terms of such a low interest rate at the moment an incentive? Um, and the other issue with it then is if the tenancy ends throughout that three year period, there's no benefit at all to the landlord. So. I'm taking that as an example to say by it's not about not introducing regulations or incentives or whatever it happens to be, but it's about understanding what we're introducing and understanding if they're actually going to have an impact and making sure that they're thought through. Um, Deputy Byrne, uh, you asked it and talked about standards of accommodation again and wondered whether local authorities re-inspect properties. Um, I'm not sure my colleague might be able to answer that question more specifically. Yes, they would. Uh, when the local authority would go out and carry out its inspections, and as you say, they might give them a list of what requirements are to do, well, then their officers would go back in order to ensure that they have been carried out. And they have their own legal avenue in which they can pursue those landlords for failing in those standards. And I have to say, we have a very good relationship uh, with a number of local authorities because they use our register and when they go out to inspect the properties, they actually check our published register to see if that tenancy is registered. And if they find that there is a tenancy in existence but it's not on our register, uh, a number of them, as I say, engage with us and would make those referrals to us. And then it's a, like a two-pronged approach. We then will follow up from a registration point of view with those uh, landlords. And by and large, we've had, you know, where that engagement happens, you have very good success. And it would be great, as 
I say, if we could get to a stage where all of the local authorities carrying out inspections you know, would be able to, to give us that, those referrals. And as a result of you know, where somebody does not comply and register, I say, bottom line for us is we can end up taking them to court and they can receive a criminal conviction. Um, you then came up, uh, asked about properties up for sale and whether landlords had, um, I suppose, in some ways used as an excuse to, 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 to take tenants out. That actually is an offence under the Residential Tenancies Act. And you, you also talked about awareness and people being aware of their rights. I'm not sure that tenants are, are, are specifically aware of their rights in this, and it's an area that we need to work on. Um, at the moment, if, it, if a tenant finds that the property that they've been uh, asked to leave and they've been served notice on, they have a right to re-enter that property. If they take a dispute to us um, then, then, and we find that it's been valid, then they actually have a right for that tenancy to recommence within that same property. Along with that, as I said, it's an offence for, for the landlord and one which we would take very seriously. Um, at the moment, we, we just, again, just had a quick look over the last week or two just to see how prevalent that was. And of the disputes that are taken to us, we think that's less than 1% of disputes that come to us at the moment. That doesn't mean it's not happening. It, it may mean that people just are not aware of their particular rights. So that's an area that we definitely need to do more on in terms of ensuring that tenants understand. Um, in terms of then you asked, I suppose, more generally about what can we do to, to advertise and let tenants know about their rights. Um, we have done two significant campaigns, advertising campaigns, um, and we will certainly continue to do that. Um, we're also trying, I suppose, as much as possible to go out to community groups and other avenues through the local authorities and so on where we can get out to tenants. On a more strategic level, in terms of one of the things that we actually don't have in, in Ireland is, is a national tenant organisation, which makes it very difficult for us to even engage with stakeholders. So, I mean, we obviously talk to Threshold and other organisations like that, but we actually don't have a national tenant organisation, and it's difficult for us to necessarily always get to the tenant in terms of communicating with them. Um, we have tried in terms of the overall increase of non-Irish nationals within uh, the rental sector to ensure that we produce our materials in multiple languages and so on. And we'll continue, I suppose, to try and put ourselves out there more than we have in, in the past. For instance, we understand that education and awareness is one of the critical issues for tenants in understanding their rights. You had asked, Chairperson, about the bedsit situation. Can from the returns? The answer to that, and I, I, I'll double check with my colleague now, is we, we may be able to go back to, I, we certainly don't have the figure off the top of our head, but we may be able to go back and, and look at that in terms of uh, seeing whether we can, and I can report back to, to the, to the yeah, committee I, along with uh, Deputy Wallace's if you, information. The, the information, yeah. that information and the information in yeah. relation to the and top 20 that Deputy Wallace was looking for, if you could yeah. send that to the clerk of the committee, it'll be distributed. Yeah. And I also, sorry, I forgot Deputy O'Dowd's question, apologies. Um, you asked about local authorities. Local authorities can, don't register with us. It's approved housing bodies or housing associations that register with us. The so local authorities are not under our remit at present. Um, so, but oh, we sorry, just on that one, I yeah. was informed that that, they, that if there was a problem with a tenancy and if it wasn't resolved by the local authority, you had the authority to step in. That isn't correct. No. If it's a privately rented, if it's if the private house owned by the local authority, in other words, it's outside of a local authority estate, you don't have any role there. No, where we would have a role, and there is would, some role you have. On it, yeah, we would yeah. see it if certainly with the local authorities taking on responsibilities for the housing assistance payment, yes. we we would we would yes. have cases coming through us yes, that's th what it is. through Sorry, that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but under the Act, um, the 2014 Housing Act, the powers of the local authority with regards to antisocial behaviour um, on a more strategic level, so if there was a continuing issue with the tenant, there's power within that Act for the local authority not to give that half payment in a specific area. So the local authority has one power. We have our powers then in terms of an overall landlord and tenant dispute, and the landlord in that case is the private landlord, and if they've taken a case, um, then we, we, we just 
judge it on the evidence that's provided to us. On top of that, regardless of what rental sector, whether it's HAP or whether it's an ordinary private rented tenancy, a third party can make uh, a claim to us for antisocial behaviour. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. That's sorry. Yeah. I was getting, yeah, that's, no. yeah. That's very important because yeah. it's the first time you can uh, look at what the local authority are deemed not to have done, isn't that it? Effectively? Well, it's, it's what the private landlord hasn't done. Yeah. So the local authority are the pay, paying yeah. rent on they're behalf the of the tenant. The tenant. Yeah. The house, but but yeah. if the landlord hasn't taken action in relation yeah. to antisocial behaviour and it's proved yes, and there's it. proven evidence, then a third party and, and the third party is making the case that the landlord hasn't taken or hasn't met his obligations. That's right. And so the case is against the landlord, and then we will look to to, yeah. to see whether the dispute but is. You are supervising the local authority in terms of, uh, and it just happened to be the local authority, yeah. but they haven't discharged their duties of regards uh, dealing with the antisocial problem, isn't that it? No, but it's... No. it's, it's Sorry, it's, so I get this oh, right. No, this is okay. Under, I'll, I'll go backwards maybe a little bit to try and help the situation. Note, if you can send us a note on it. I can, I can send you a note, but just yeah, to be clear... Yeah, because it's, uh, you know, it's important. Yeah. 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 Private landlord yeah. uh, with the payment coming through the local yeah. authority. But just one very specific point on that. You made the point that a third party can raise, um, yeah. can make a complaint if there's um, antisocial behaviour. Is it any third party or a third party that's adversely affected themselves? Jeanette is our disputes expert, so I'll let her. Yes, um, it would be a third party that would be directly and adversely affected. So um, a public representative bring... on behalf of that person could not make the... Well, we now have it that with the new amendments um, that came in in 2015, um, a third party um, group, neighbouring group, or a management company, etc., can bring a claim on behalf of a third party that is directly and adversely affected. However, it does go back to the point, and, and, and we have seen it before, that it all it, it is all based on evidence. Um, so the third parties would potentially have to come before the PRTB and produce the evidence um, that there is anti social behaviour. Um, but we would also state um, that there is two types of um, remedies available. If they go down the adjudication route, you are looking for damages. That is the only um, remedy that would be available. Um, but we uh, have seen with third party applications that mediation is um, an option to take uh, because it, they can reach a resolution themselves as to see how the dispute can be ended. Because some parties do feel that damages isn't an adequate remedy for it. Um, so so uh, mediation has been seen as a successful route to go down. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, that concludes this part of the meeting. I'd like to thank the Residential Tenancies Board, Deputy Fogarty, or uh, Ms Fogarty, Ms Carroll and Ms, Ms Ward. Thank you very much. We'll suspend for a couple of moments as we get the next witnesses. Thank you very much. Thanks. And I read the note on privilege for the witnesses. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of the evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name, or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. Your opening statements will be published on the committee website following the meeting, and members are reminded of the long-standing practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I'm pleased at this stage to welcome uh, the Free Legal Advice Centres here this afternoon, represented by uh, Mr Paul Joyce, Kieran Finlay and Ms Edna Lynch. Edna Lynch. Um, the, as I said, the full submissions have been circulated to the members. And at this stage, I'd like to ask Mr Joyce uh, to make an opening statement, I suppose, summarising the presentation that you've made to us. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, and thank you to the committee and the officials for the opportunity to address you today on what, by common consent, is an extremely urgent issue uh, at this point. And it's very welcome, obviously, that the, the committee has been appointed to look into 
these issues. Um, our emphasis this afternoon primarily is on the mortgage arrears problem. Uh, it's, it's the issue in connection with housing and homelessness that we're most familiar with, the, the danger, uh, potential danger of loss of accommodation leading to potential homelessness. Our presentation also looks at a few social welfare issues um, and also some, some legal aid issues and it also mentions the right to housing. Now I'm conscious that you've had a very long day uh, with a lot of presentations so um, I'm just really going to skim over uh, what we're saying. We don't work in the broader housing area. We do obviously support uh, and, and respect greatly a number of the organisations that you'll be familiar with um, from charities and NGOs dealing with homelessness campaigning and services uh, and, and also a number of the, our colleague independent law centres and organisations such as Threshold and all the housing associations working uh, across the country. Um, on the broader housing issues, we, we would just have a, a couple of very short observations. First of all, we believe that the privatisation of, of the housing market into a mortgage lending market is what has essentially caused the main cause of the housing crisis that we're dealing with at present. We can also see that there's evidence of a supply problem um, and issues around development finance, issues around planning and, and regulatory issues, that obviously both of those issues need to be addressed. We'd be of the view that the rent certainty measures are unlikely to have any effect really on increased rents and associated evictions until um, the housing supply, both private and public, is dealt with. So just on those broader issues. Um, now on the mortgage arrears issue, we have presented in the paper a number of, of sets of statistics, uh, damn life and statistics and so on, but just to very much summarise those, um, the clear problem at present is the two-year plus category and the one-year plus category, and, and just one figure of importance, the number of uh, principal dwelling house mortgages in arrears over two years has grown exponentially as a percentage of the overall arrears total. So it's now 40% and if you add the one year to two year category we're over 50%. So it's very clear where the intractable problem is. It's in the two year plus category and the amount, the average amount owed by those accounts is considerable. Um, 36,000 accounts. We don't know exactly how many households that is, but we think it's fairly close to 32, 33,000 households in danger of loss of accommodation, and that's an extremely urgent problem. There has been a lot of restructuring has taken place over the last number of years, but again, just very briefly, just because a mortgage has been restructured doesn't mean it's out of the woods. And in our view, there has been an over-reliance on split mortgages and particularly on the capitalisation of arrears as a sustainable restructure. And there's already evidence of a number of those accounts getting into difficulty, although restructured. Um, just in terms of actual possession orders executed, contrary to popular belief, there's been 1,300 in the last three years. There's been another 2,300 voluntary surrenders of family homes. So that's 3,600 uh, family homes gone back to lenders in 2013, 14 and 15. We don't believe that anybody is tracking what happens to those households once the property has been vacated. There's also a clear problem in the buy-to-let sector, um, and again, that seems to be increasing. 1,500 buy-to-let mortgages repossessed uh, in that three-year period, and over 800 in 2015 alone, so, so this is a growing problem. And there's also approximately 6,000 rent receivers in on, on buy-to-let properties. Now, the principal um, instrument for resolving mortgage arrears up to now has been the Central Bank's Code of Conduct on Mortgage Arrears. Again, there's quite a lot in the presentation about this. We believe that it's been fairly ineffective uh, and very imbalanced and basically the, the balance of power remains very firmly with the lender at all times and I can go into that in, in greater detail in the Q&A uh, if you wish. But for us it's a fair procedures nightmare and it wouldn't stand up in a court. Um, there is very little by way of proper written information given to borrowers in many cases on the decision making process and, and the most important thing is there is no right of appeal to an independent uh, third party. 
To further complicate matters, the Supreme Court has decided in the Dunn and Dunphy case back in May 2015 that the Code of Conduct is not admissible fundamentally in legal proceedings apart from the necessity to comply with the three-month moratorium. That means that when you are faced with repossession proceedings, non-compliance with the Code is no huge use to you as an argument uh, in the courts. I would just like to take a, a very brief second to, to quote from the particular um, decision in um, Dunn and Dunphy as follows. The Supreme Court said, if it is to be regarded as a matter of policy that the law governing the circumstances in which financial institutions may be entitled to possession is too heavily weighted in favour of those financial institutions, then it is, in accordance with the separation of powers, a matter for the Oireachtas to recalibrate recalibra those laws. No such formal recalibration has taken place. In other words, the Supreme Court is saying it's up to the legislature to legislate in this area. The courts won't invent defences uh, for borrowers. Um, now, there's about to be, we know that in, in county registrars' courts up and down the country, county registrars are doing their best to uh, prevent the unnecessary repossession of family homes, but they're, they're fighting against the tide. Um, there is a new scheme of legal advice and assistance and financial advice and assistance about to be rolled out, but, but we will certainly call into question at this point what use it will be fundamentally in the long run for borrowers to have access to this legal advice service when, first of all, anecdotally, only about 10% of borrowers turn up and respond.